And uh, my topic is papillary neoplasms of the breast. And in this presentation, we'll review morphology and diagnostic criteria. I'll uh, discuss upgrades and management of papilloma at core needle biopsy and uh, touch on what is new according to the WHO. Now, this is the WHO. Uh, this is a summary of uh, the WHO classification of papillary neoplasms of the breast. They are included among epithelial tumors of the breast, and they range all from intraductal papilloma to invasive papillary carcinoma. We'll review them uh, one by one. But first of all, let's ask what is a papillary neoplasm and how do we diagnose one? And this is defined uh, as uh, a neoplasm that is composed predominantly of papillae. About 90, 95% of the tumor should be composed of papillae. And each papilla consists of a fibrovascular core that is covered by epithelium with or without a myoepithelial layer. And that uh, depends on the type of papillary lesion. So we will have different shape, you know, different flavors of papillary lesions. But essentially, if you evaluate a papillary lesion, you have to evaluate these two components, epithelium and myepithelium, to come up with a diagnosis. Now, the myepithelial cells, as we were discussing before, are extremely important in the breast, and especially in the context of papillary neoplasms. They can be either present or absent. If they're present, that can be around the, tum the tumor itself or the cyst and the duct within, you know, along the wall that contains this papillary lesion, as well as along the papillae. And that uh, occurs in an intraductal papilloma. If they're present around the duct, all around the duct that contains the papillary lesion, but not along the papillae, then we have a papillary DCIS that can have two forms, either a classic papillary DCIS or a solid papillary carcinoma in situ. If the myopithelial cells are absent, then we definitely have a carcinoma. And there are, again, two sort of uh, groups of carcinoma without myopithelial cells and with the papillary architecture. One group is the so-called, uh, you know, an indolent group of that includes uh, an encapsulated papillary carcinoma and a solid papillary carcinoma in situ that is, uh, if you notice, uh, included also among uh, the lesions with myopithelial cells. And I'll discuss why is that. And then we have the obvious, straightforward uh, invasive carcinomas that have no myepithelium and can range from solid papillary carcinoma invasive or invasive papillary carcinoma. And uh, then the other question is how to evaluate the epithelial proliferation uh, within a papillary lesion. The papillary lesions tend to be very, very busy, at least in my uh, experience. And it can be sometimes even overwhelming to figure out where to start. So the approach is very simple. At least uh, uh, I use this approach. I identify fibrovascular cores, two parallel, two adjacent fibrovascular cores, and uh, then evaluate the epithelium that is in between these adjacent fibrovascular core using the same criteria that Dr. Collins has so nicely illustrated for the diagnosis of UDH, ADH, and the CIS. So I apply it in this, in this limited space. Um, and uh, for example, in this case on the left, uh, this epithelial proliferation has the feature of UDH. I will apply the same uh, evaluation in different areas of a large papillary lesion and I came up uh, for this case with the diagnosis of papilloma with AD UDH. On the other side, uh, again, uh, sometimes uh, they, in a carcinoma, the fibrovascular cores are not so obvious. They tend to be very delicate, filiform, but I still try to draw these imaginary lines and then evaluate the space uh, in between adjacent fibrovascular cores. And uh, this proliferation, for example, here is uh, uh, fairly monotonous, uh, appears to be pre-reformed and punched out in some areas, uh, 
Uh, so this qualifies as a carcinoma. If I had it in a duct, it would definitely be a typical. There is a lot of it. It's a carcinoma. Then I have a papillary carcinoma. Then I will classify it further. So it's a simple approach, but I find it useful. Little tips uh, that can be helpful in the evaluation of the epithelial proliferation. If there is apocrine metaplasia that merges with uh, the duct epithelium in a, um, in a papillary lesion, generally this favors a benign epithelial proliferation. Extracellular mucin in a papillary neoplasm, I think it's good, to, it should make you think about a solid and papillary carcinoma that oftentimes is associated with mucin production. And uh, another feature is the patient age. That is not on the slide, but you have, you have that information. Um, it's important because in general, papillary neoplasms that occur in postmenopausal women tend to be more frequently malignant. So let's talk about intraductal papilloma. This is the WHO definition, uh, is located within a duct, can be either central, usually solitary or peripheral, it can be multiple, small papillomas, and it's again composed of papillary projections with perivascular pores covered by an epithelial and a myoepithelial layer. And as I mentioned before, intraductal papilloma is the only papillary neoplasm of the breast that has a continuous layer of myoepithelial cells along the papillae, as well as around, uh, around the duct that contains it. And it's entirely intraductal. Intraductal papilloma is uh, not, uh, you know, it's not an uncommon lesion in a series of uh, uh, over 9,000 benign breast excision from the Mayo Clinic. About 5% of the cases had an intraductal papilloma with or without atypia. We predominantly deal with uh, these central solitary intraductal papillomas because uh, they come to clinical presentation sometimes because of a clear or rarely bloody nipple discharge, they're symptomatic, or there is a palpable mass more rarely. And these central papillomas can occur at any age, but they tend to be more frequent in younger women, younger being premenopausal between age 30 to 50. By, these are images from different mod imaging modalities. The best modality for the evaluation of a intraductal papilloma is by ultrasound that highlights the cystic space filled by partially filled by a, the papillary mass, and sometimes they are dilated ducts. This is a, a galactogram where the papilloma appears as a negative image. Uh, this is a gross uh, uh, photo of uh, highlighting the cauliflower kind of appearance of a papilloma that usually is inserted uh, along, you know, to the wall of the duct uh, by a broad stop. Um, the size ranges from few millimeters to very large, uh, over cent five centimeters. And as I said, we'll focus on central and solitary papillomas because peripheral, poly peripheral papillomas are uncommon and they usually are incidental findings. Now, in intraductal papilloma, usually when we say intraductal papilloma, we imply without a tipia. That second uh, designation is usually dropped out. If there is atypia, we should report it. And the papilloma can be called a typical intraductal papilloma. We can say ADH in an intraductal papilloma or intraductal papilloma with ADH. Uh, ADH in a papilloma can be up to less than three millimeters. So the two millimeter cutoff that we use, and Dr. Collins has mentioned before, for in general in the breast to distinguish between ADH and log DCIS. It's kind of extended to three millimeter in uh, intraductal papilloma. And it's important that the ADH be in the papilloma to call it a typical. Otherwise, we can say ADH near a papilloma. Now, another type of atypia could be ALH, but that does not qualify, according to the WHO terminology, does not qualify an intraductal papilloma as a typical. It will be intraductal papilloma with ALH and will be managed accordingly. Then we can have foci, and here on the right is an example of an atypical intraductal papilloma where there is a tiny focus of atypia, ADH, 
that uh, has monotonous cells uh, spanning less than three millimeter in size. This is an example of an atypical intraductal papilloma. Now, if we have the same low grade uh, intraductal uh, atypical proliferation uh, that has a size of three millimeters or greater, um, then we, um, we have a DCIS, a low nuclear grade DCIS in an intraductal papilloma. I must say that personally in my practice, I kind of stretch a little bit this three millimeter size to even more, you know, I make it even four millimeter, uh, even bigger. Uh, and I'm uh, always very reluctant to call uh, low grade DCIS in an intraductal papilloma unless there is a lot of it. Um, but if there is intermediate or high nuclear grade, uh, the proliferation as intermediate or high nuclear grade, then size doesn't matter. And you have to use the same diagnostic criteria Dr. Collins illustrated. This is an example of lobular neoplasia in the papilloma. Um, in my experience, it's generally classic lobular neoplasia, florid or extremely rare. And uh, management, as I will discuss uh, in my presentation on lobular neoplasia, and also later on for papilloma, varies greatly. Here's another example of an intraductal papilloma with ADH. Now, calponin and P63 basically are providing you with the visualization of the fibrovascular course of the papilloma so that you can better appreciate the extent of the epithelial proliferation. In this case, the epithelial proliferation that occupies these spaces is quite, is very uniformly and diffusely positive for ER. So this staining supports the diagnosis of an intraductal papilloma with ADH. Now, if a patient has intraductal papilloma with or without atypia, what's the risk of subsequent cancer? There are two studies that have looked at that. One is from the Vanderbilt group, the other one from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, they looked at the risk of subsequent carcinoma in patients that have been found to have papilloma with or without atypia. And their results were somewhat similar, well, not exactly the same, but uh, very overlapping. If there is a tipia, there is a five to 7.5 fold relative risk or increased risk of subsequent carcinoma. The risk, uh, the 7.5 fold risk was uh, mainly due to having multiple peripheral intraductal papillomas with a tipia. And, uh, uh, I will not touch more on that, but really having a papilloma with atypia has uh, in a sense a very similar risk to having uh, atypia in general. If there is no atypia though, the relative risk is comparable to that of proliferative change without atypia. So per se, we always think of intraductal papilloma as a high risk lesion, well, if there is no atypia, the risk is not that high. I think it's probably, we classify it as a high risk lesion because of the difficulty in evaluating intraductal papilloma. And so people have, uh, you know, felt comfortable over time to classify it in the high risk group. But this study suggests that the risk, if there is no atypia, is the same as for uh, intraductal benign epithelial proliferation. Then uh, why do we need to take them out, right? Uh, um, in general, papilloma without, uh, all papillomas, all papillary lesions uh, were excised until very recently. And we need uh, to excise all the lesions uh, that have atypia or a carcinoma. But uh, why should we continue to excise a papilloma if there is no epithelial atypia? And that's where there are big regional differences, as I found out preparing this lecture. I'll give you, I'm very familiar with the approach we use in Northern America, in the United States and Canada, uh, similar to that uh, in Australasia. It turns out that in European countries it's a little different. So first I give you the USA perspective, uh, papilloma without atypia. Uh, found in a core needle biopsy that is deemed to be radiology pathology concordant. These are, the upgrade, these are a few studies in the past uh, decade that have looked at the upgrade rate to carcinoma, invasive or in situ. 
the upgrade rate ranges from zero to 6.8 percent in this study, so about zero to seven percent. Most of the upgrades are to ECIS with a rate that ranges from zero to six percent, and only few cases are upgrades to carcinoma. Now, many of the investigators looked for features that correlate with upgrade. And they found that uh, if the mass is large, greater than 10 millimeter or 15 millimeter in another study or palpable, or is associated with uh, a synchronous carcinoma, um, or the patient has clinical symptoms, including uh, nipple discharge or even bloody discharge, then all these features are predictors of upgrade. And most of these studies have concluded that there is no need to excise these lesions unless the lesion is very large or is the patient is symptomatic or there is a, a concurrent carcinoma. This is, our, however, our own retrospective studies. Here is a, a prospective study that has looked at the excision of intraductal papilloma without a titia, diagnosed a cordido biopsy with rat path concordance. This is a multi-institutional study that included only BIRATS uh, score up to four ca patient cases, no palpable, no clinical symptoms, uh, no epithelial atitia, including no ADH and no non-classic LCIS elsewhere in the same core biopsy. And the patient had no personal history of breast carcinoma. They included, uh, they studied 116 patients uh, from 10 different centers. Um, the majority had uh, uh, lesions with BIRAD score four that actually correlated to an area of, uh, in two thirds of the cases, there was a mammographic mass or a distortion. By the local pathology review, out of these 116 introductal papillomas without a titia, two yielded carcinoma at excision with an upgrade rate of 1.7%. And they were tiny carcinomas, three millimeter low grade DCIS. And then there was one case, not even called DCIS, it's ADH approaching low grade DCIS. And there were a few cases, uh, four cases with atypia. By the same cases, the same slides were reviewed centrally by two pathologists. And they confirmed the diagnosis of intraductal papilloma without a TPI in 85% of these cases, 73% of the total. And uh, looked then at the excisions and actually they did not confirm any diagnosis of DCIS. So according to the Central Pathology Review, zero cases of carcinoma were found. There were zero upgrades. There were more cases of atypia um, found at excision. And uh, uh, basically, based on this uh, study, again, the only prospective study and all the previous literature, there doesn't seem to be a need to, to excise an intraductal papilloma without atypia. And this is a statement by the American Society of Breast Surgeons, where they say the decision to excise a papillary lesion without atypia should be individualized based on the patient risk, including criteria such as the lesion size, whether the symptoms, including palpability and nipple discharge, and other breast cancer risk factor. And all other ones should be followed closely with imaging. Now, of course, uh, if we have to be so precise uh, to, in the diagnosis of papilloma without a tipia, the diagnostic accuracy is critical because it makes a huge difference. If there is no atypia, no excision. If the case is rat path concordant, if there is atypia, then there is excision. And this puts a really a big burden on the pathologist because we could be underdiagnosing atypia or in some cases overdiagnosing papilloma. And some interesting information comes from the same uh, um, retrospective uh, TBCRC study I just presented it comes from those uh, cases, uh, 31 cases where the initial diagnosis of intraductal papilloma without a tipia was not confirmed. Interestingly, in 10 cases, uh, the central pathology review identified the presence of a tipia, ADH, near the intraductal papilloma in eight cases, and in two, the papilloma was atypical. 
Here is a case, uh, not from that study, but the case uh, uh, that we had, uh, we received from outside, with original diagnosis of intraductal papilloma without a titia. And uh, again, think about the criteria Dr. Collins mentioned earlier, these cells are atypical. There is, uh, you know, monotony of the nuclei, very uniform, they look uh, all very similar in size and shape. Cell borders are visible. This is an example of uh, a typical ductal proliferation with some papillary architecture. And so we revised this, uh, we called this case uh, ADH. And um, I bring up this case, and the patient had excision had DCIS. I bring up this case because uh, to me it's uh, amazing that in the current uh, era where we have so many tools at our disposal, ER stain, CK56, it would have been enough uh, to just stain this lesion with ER and CK56 and obtain a ER positive HERCU with CK56 a low um, pattern to, you know, stay away from trouble. So I always say, use the stains and stay away from, from trouble. So this is an example of a case initially called the no atypia, but reclassified as atypical. The other cases are also interesting, the benign mimics of an intraductal papilloma. These are exemplified in these images that are not from the paper, but uh, very similar. Here is an example of papillary apocrine metaplasia. Some people call this a papilloma. Apocrine metaplasia is by its own nature papillary. Forget about mentioning it. Plicated subareolar duct may mimic a papilloma, but in reality, in a deeper section, this will merge with the rest of the duct wall, and it's not a real papilloma there. Sometimes even fibroadenomatous changes, you know, the portion of the front of a little fibroadenoma may become detached. There is a pipilium on the surface and they can be mistaken as a, a papilloma, although many times they will lack a fibrovascular core. And here is an example of a case uh, that mimicked a papilloma, and here is the excision. But the most common situation is when there is um, uh, these uh, little micro populations within uh, a small uh, duct, and some of them are associated even with uh, some usual ductal hyperplasia, um, and uh, these are all cases that were called papillomas, small papillomas. I personally don't call them when they are so small. I just say epithelial hyperplasia. I just don't mention it because to me they don't deserve, uh, you know, to be qualified as papillomas. But there is uh, no lower cutoff size to discriminate whether a lesion is a papilloma or not. Uh, so all these cases were uh, called uh, small papillomas. And uh, then we, so I told you about uh, the USA perspective. Uh, we think that there is no real upgrade uh, to a excision of a papilloma if there is no epithelial atypia. In terms of uh, European approach, uh, here is uh, a table that I took from uh, a publication, uh, a com you know, put together by a multidisciplinary group of uh, European experts, uh, and uh, they, their conclusion was that uh, a papilloma without a tipia yields a very broad range of upgrade rates at excision that, depending on the studies, goes from 2.3 to 13 percent. Uh, in some of these studies, it's unclear whether radiology pathology concordance was assessed. That uh, is essential in making the decision to excise or not. But overall, the conclusion was that uh, if there was a vacuum assisted biopsy, an excision after a vacuum biopsy had significantly lower upgrade rate, uh, only 1.6% than excision after a core needle biopsy. So their uh, final recommendation was that a papillary lesion visible on imaging should undergo excision with a vacuum assisted biopsy. And then, uh, it, and this applies to lesions that are up to 2.5 2 centimeter in diameter, a big papilloma. Um, larger lesions that cannot be completely removed by vacuum assisted biopsy need open excision and thereafter surveillance is justified. So a different approach. Now, introductal papillomas, as I've already mentioned, 
come in a very different size uh, and uh, not shape, but size for sure. And some are very large, uh, some are smaller. Of course, core needle biopsy sampling will give, uh, you know, a different uh, uh, assessment of these different lesions uh, and will be, might be less uh, reliable in a, if a very large lesion is uh, sampled. That's why the size criteria. But if uh, we have a tiny lesion, like a micropapilloma that is up to two millimeter in size, a core needle biopsy may remove it entirely and there are no upgrades at excision and no excision is required. And there is consensus on this both, uh, uh, on both sides of the ocean. In the US, uh, we call them micropapillomas and we don't excise them. Or we say in a note, uh, it appears to be completely excised by core needle biopsy. In the, the European group, uh, uh, call them B2 lesions if completely surrounded by a duct structure. Now, there are many mimics of intraductal papilloma with and without a tipia, and I've listed them here. Some of them we'll discuss. I already talked about the benign mimics of intraductal papilloma. There is a whole list of tumors that can look papillary. And uh, I'm going to touch briefly on two tumors, adenomyopithelioma and tall cell carcinoma with reverse polarity. Adenomyopithelioma is a rare tumor of incidence unknown, it can occur at any age, uh, typically affects elderly women over age 60. It's a biphasic neoplasm that uh, is composed of small epithelium lined spaces with an inner luminal ductal cell layer, no atypia if it is a, an adenomyopithelioma without atypia, but then has a very variably and large and clearly noticeable abluminal myopithelial layer. Um, and that is critical for the diagnosis. Uh, the presence of these uh, enlarged and evident on H&E, evident uh, myopithelial cells is essential for the diagnosis and can be highlighted with myopithelial stains. Now, adenomyopithelioma can really look very uh, similar in some ways to an intraductal papilloma with prominent myopithelial cells. Uh, the difference is uh, at excision will be easier. Of course, everything is easier uh, in the excision specimen where an intraductal papilloma is contained entirely within a duct or cystic space, while an adenomyopithelioma tends to have a more solid, not truly papillary architecture, although in some areas it can look papillary. Again, I don't have time to discuss the differential diagnosis, but this should suffice. Then we have a spectrum of adenomyopithelioma into atypical and malignant adenomyopitheliomas, where a carcinoma can develop from the epithelial or myopithelial component or from both, and then we can call it epithelial myopithelial carcinoma. Here is an example of a carcinoma arising from the epithelial component of an adenomyopithelioma. Usually these are carcinoma of invasive of no special type, even a lobular carcinoma can arise. The interesting ones are the malignant adenomyopithelioma that arise in, um, from the myopithelial component. And these tend to be metaplastic carcinoma. Here is an example of a metaplastic spindle cell carcinoma, but there is uh, the possibility of a squamous, low-grade adenosquamous, matrix producing. So interesting tumors. I bring them up because from a genetic point of view, there seems to be some differences in adenomyopithelioma, whether they are ER positive or ER negative. The ER positive one have the same hotspot mutation in PIK3CA and AKT1 that are found in intraductal papilloma. And maybe they are intraductal papilloma and we just call them differently. The interesting one are the predominantly ER negative that uh, we found uh, harbor this mutation in HRAS, uh, particularly in Q61R, and uh, combined with PIK3CA mutation. And this is the same mutations that you find in the malignant adenomyopithelioma that arise from, uh, uh, from a you know, a typical adenomyopithelioma with this mutation and demonstrate a progression. And these tumors have no HER2 amplification. Other mutation of HRAS have also been identified. 
And the interesting thing that, uh, that's why I mentioned this, uh, is that uh, there is an antibody that recognizes this uh, specifically altered protein, and we found that it correlates uh, with uh, the uh, genetic alteration in uh, the tumor. So five of seven cases that had uh, the hras 261 r mutation were also positive, while none of the adenomyoepithelioma without these mutations was positive. So it has possible diagnostic application. The other entity in, uh, after this digression on adenomyoepithelioma is tall cell carcinoma with reverse polarity, a new entity. How many of you have heard about it? Uh, a lot. How many of you have ever seen a case? Uh, very few. One of us, yeah. Oh yeah, excellent. Uh, so this is a very rare subtype of invasive carcinoma. The patient's uh, median age is 64 years. They're typically triple negative or very ERPR, AR low. They're positive for five, six, seven. So basal, um, high molecular weight, low molecular weight cytokeratin, as also for carretinin. And they have uh, this uh, uh, IDH2 mutation combined with PIK3CA mutation. The behavior is indolent. Here is the typical morphology, a solid and papillary pattern with a solid, center, um, solid nest with a central fibrovascular core. Many times we find these foamy histiocytes, and they are composed of these tall columnar cells that have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and reverse nuclear polarity. Some uh, here is the nuclear polarity, reverse polarity, best uh, appreciated either at the periphery of the tumor or around the fibrovascular cords. And uh, interestingly, the, the nuclei of these lesions, to me, resemble very much the nuclei of UDH, uh, they, because they can have uh, intranuclear uh, cytoplasmic vacuoles and grooves. So that... Uh, I always include interductal papilloma in the differential diagnosis of tall cell carcinoma with reverse polarity. Uh, that also includes a DCIS, solid papillary carcinoma, secretory and carcinoma, and metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here is an example of a core biopsy of a tall cell carcinoma with reverse polarity. Uh, typical morphology, foamy histiocytes in the fibrovascular core, some reverse polarity, but it's not always that obvious, right? Once you know what it is, it's obvious, but it can be very difficult. And, uh, you know, you need uh, to have a high level of suspicion because actually this tumor pretty much a stain like UDH can have very low ER and some positivity for CK5-6 in a mosaic pattern. Here is another case, more ER and a lot more CK5-6. So for me, it is a differential diagnosis of uh, intraductal papilloma. And uh, again, immunohistochemistry comes to the rescue because there is also an antibody that detects the protein encoded by the mutated gene and is also very specific. This time it stains the cytoplasm. Going back to papillary lesions, we have papillary DCIS, papillary neoplasms. We have papillary DCIS. It's composed of fibrovascular cores with carcinoma that has no myoepithelial cells, but is contained within a duct that has myoepithelial cells, as demonstrated in this triple stain. It may occur in isolation. In my experience, this is one of the few cases where I found it alone but usually is one of several architectural patterns in a case of DCIS, and the nuclear atypia determines the grade. Encapsulated, it comes often in the differential diagnosis of encapsulated papillary carcinoma, which tends to occur in postmenopausal women, can also occur in men. It typically presents with bloody nipple discharge, but not always, and presents typically as a circumscribed rate or subareolar mass that may cause even a bulging of the nipple or flattening of the nipple. And here is intracystic with this papillary projection within a dilated duct. And here is a, a, an examination, a gross photo. This is a cystic, usually a substantial tumor that forms a cystic mass that has rounded a pushing border and usually surrounded by a thick fibrous capsule. The fibrovascular cores are thin and delicate 
and uh, a cribriform pattern between uh, the cardiovascular cores very similar to the DCIS uh, is, is found. Now the WHO recently stipulated that uh, to be called the EPC, the nuclear grade can be only low or intermediate, cannot be high grade. And the EPC has no myoepithelial cells, not along the papillae, not around the duct. So technically, this would be an invasive carcinoma, right? But it's very indolent. It's a, probably an invasive carcinoma with blunt invasion. How do we separate it from uh, DC, uh, papillary DCIS? I use a size as a criteria. Usually, the size of EPC tends to be substantially larger than the adjacent ducts with DCIS. And then, uh, you know, my epithelial stains can help uh, in separating the two lesions. So they're present uh, around the papillary DCIS, uh, not around uh, EPC. Nonetheless, uh, they are uh, staged the same because the behavior is so indolent uh, that EPC, unless there is associated invasion, uh, behaves like DCIS. So that's why it's so important to do proper sampling of this lesion, focusing on the periphery of the tumor where you can find the frank invasion if it is present. And frank invasion is defined as carcinoma with an unequivocal invasive pattern beyond the fibrous capsule. So an example like this, here is the EPC and here is invasive carcinoma. This can occur in 20 to 60% of cases. These are a few series in the literature. And uh, the presence of invasive carcinoma is actually unrelated to the size of the EPC. The majority of these tumors are well differentiated invasive ductal, can also be mucinous, tubular, or invasive cribriform. And uh, at least in the published series that I was able to review, they're all PT1 in size ranging from 0.2 to 1.2 centimeters. And the majority are ER and positive, HER2 negative. So tend to be a low grade uh, type of invasive carcinoma. If there is frank invasion, you stage it by that uh, and report uh, the size and Nottingham grade, the ERPR status of the invasive component and you manage accordingly. If there is only EPC, as I said before, the stage is uh, uh, PIS in situ, as if it were the CIS. And uh, we report the nuclear grade, the ER status, and the size. And in a note, uh, one may report the size of the EPC and the CIS, both separately and together. Um, it is managed as the CIS and has excellent prognosis. Although there are a few reports of EPC with a low lymph node or distant mets, so very few. Um, and always there is a doubt, uh, was it only EPC or not? You know, pathologists are like St. Thomas. Uh, I don't believe if I don't put my hand on it. Uh, and uh, I am a St. Thomas too. Um, not a saint, but a Thomas kind of person. Uh, that's my approach. And these are two cases I have seen where there was only EPC and there were metastases, distant meds. Here is an EPC in a 44-year-old woman who 17 years later developed a bone metastasis and the patient had had a mastectomy. We had reviewed all her cases as actually as part of a study that we did. Um, and so I still had the slides in my office when I was asked to look at the core biopsy of uh, the bone met identical, very, very bland. And then uh, another case, this one I signed out, uh, it was an EPC in a 74 year old man who four years later developed lung metastasis. So I wonder, but I, these are, you know, two anecdotal cases, whether young patient age or even gender of the patient could have, uh, you know, could be associated with the worst behavior and I'm especially concerned when there is a diagnosis of EPC in a very young patient because uh, uh, maybe it takes time for this tumor to become more, uh, to demonstrate its aggressive behavior. This is a summary slide on the differential diagnosis. You will have these slides. I'm not going to go through this list. Uh, solid papillary carcinoma is another entity, postmenopausal women, 
um, over age 60. It can also occur in men, presents as a palpable breast mass or a mammographic uh, mass or abnormality, and again, may be associated with a nipple discharge, oftentimes bloody. By imaging, it presents as a mass, can have irregular borders, but it's really very difficult by mammography to give that uh, diagnosis, same by ultrasound. Gross appearance, it's very soft, uh, well circumscribed and tan, uh, the tan pink mass. The WHO provides criteria to separate in situ and invasive. You know, when I was uh, a little younger, we used to just lump it together and say solid papillary carcinoma, in situ and invasive. We are trying to be more precise and develop criteria that can help identify, you know, separate the two and maybe re better report the size of the invasive carcinoma. In situ is uh, defined by the WHO as composed of expansive round to oval solid nodules that have uh, uh, a distribution pattern that is consistent with an in situ process, regardless of the presence of myoepithelial cells around the nodules. And this is a monotonous uh, proliferation of cells uh, that have usually mild to moderate nuclear atypia and uh, the fibrovascular cores as shown here are, can be very inconspicuous and almost overwhelmed by the solid uh, epithelial proliferation. Here is an example of the morphology that can be spindled in some areas. As Dr. Uh, Collins pointed out, uh, some cases may mimic uh, um, UDH, but notice that there is really no maturation of the cells across uh, this duct, the nuclei are all uh, similar in size uh, and chromatin quality throughout the duct. And uh, palisading along the fibrovascular course is common. Many times the tumor cells have abundant cytoplasm with this bluish uh, grayish quality containing mucin. Highly nice fibro and sclerotic fibrovascular course can also be found in, in some areas of the sclerosis uh, uh, can uh, mimic a focus of uh, invasive carcinoma. In this case, not always my epithelial stains may help, uh, but uh, you know, the pattern uh, in this particular case looks uh, uh, more sclerotic than uh, react, you know, desmoplastic. The stroma is very pink and the eosinophilic, while in invasion you would have a reactive uh, cellular stroma. You can find scattered mitosis, as I said, SPC in situ uh, is called as such regardless of the presence of my epithelial cells. Because really, it's amazing. This tumor looks like in situ here. There is not a single my epithelial cell. And here it's a little bit more irregular, but there is plenty of my epithelium. So the my epithelial cells with this particular tumor do not help. You have to look at the outline of the ducts and also how many of these uh, nodules you find and what's the distribution. In contrast, in invasive carcinoma, SPC, the invasive component can have a solid papillary or a mucinous appearance. It can also be positive for neuroendocrine antigens, both components. More rarely, you will find carcinomas of no special type, uh, like uh, the typical invasive ductal or lobular cribriform or tubular. And there are these large nests that have an irregular outline with a pattern not consistent with involvement of pre-existing asini, so a lot of it, or, or uh, ducts, or even a benign alterations uh, or, you know, sclerosing lesion and so forth. Uh, if you find carcinoma in extracellular mucin pool at the periphery of the lesion, this also qualifies as invasion, and the, it's really the mucinous carcinoma component uh, usually these tumors are ER and PR positive, HER2 negative, not amplified. And here side by side, an example of an in situ, very uh, smooth outline, no irregularity. And it, I, you know, whether they are my epithelial cells or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, in contrast to this, uh, that is much more irregular in this particular uh, case uh, that is invasive. Here is another example where we have, uh, you know, this large solid nest, but you look at the outline, uh, they are uh, kind of indented, right? Uh, 
they are hugging the fat. Uh, I always say it's not a good thing to hug the fat. And uh, they are indented by the adipocytes uh, and have a distribution that is inconsistent with uh, a, um, a DCIS pattern. A DCIS, so this is an example of uh, invasive. Here is another example where there is a solid papillary carcinoma, smooth outline. This probably is in situ. There is a component of invasion. And here is much more mucinous. The cell morphology is exactly the same, except for the mucin. Here is another example with the same irregular outline and invasion in association with the mucin production. Now, if you have only in situ, then uh, you classify it as PTIS uh, and the reported size as for invasive DCI, for, uh, oh, sorry, for DCIS and SSCR. If there is invasion, diagnosed only if you find the obvious, com you know, conf you're confident there is invasive carcinoma with the features we just reviewed and report the size, the grade, and the uh, receptor status only of the invasive component. And again, it's a tumor that overall seems to have an excellent prognosis. In the differential diagnosis, there can be cases where it can mimic UDH uh, that is seen in a papilloma here. Actually, it's a unique uh, case with the UDH with the central necrosis. And even the SPC in situ has a corpus of minimal central necrosis. Uh, in the differential diagnosis, you can use ER and CK56. Uh, that will be very helpful, as described, you know, mentioned before. The other differential that I have encountered is uh, sometimes with florid LCIS because the cells are really small, very similar in size, uh, the nuclear features, and whether there is necrosis or not, uh, you know, there is uh, some similarity. Uh, of course, uh, this is not a diseased tumor while florid LCIS is characterized by decision. And you can do the ecadine and P120 catene in stains uh, to demonstrate. Uh, in general, in SPC in situ, the features you don't find in, in florid LCIS will include fibrovascular cores so that are seen here and the presence of uh, extracellular mucin in a majority of cases. Another differential is with encapsulated papillary carcinoma. Sometimes a, a solid papillary carcinoma also may have a capsule all around and uh, again, uh, and can look almost creepy forming in some areas, but uh, the, the solid component in EPC tends to be only focal, shouldn't be so extensive. And, uh, um, you know, but this differential diagnosis sometimes can be difficult. Practically speaking, uh, there is uh, no substantial difference as long as uh, your uh, primary differential would be with an in situ lesion. Neuroendocrine markers can be positive in in situ or invasive. There is no need to do these stains uh, and can be positive or negative. It is a, a, a useful adjunct finding, but it's not necessary for diagnosis. Another marker that in addition to synapto and chromo, ISNM1 seems to be highly expressed in uh, uh, SPC, and this is a study we did recently. And in some cases, ISNM1 was the only positive marker. And then the last entity in this uh, um, you know, overview is invasive papillary carcinoma. Very rare, entirely papillary, frankly invasive. There is no myopithelium anywhere, and it has to be graded according to the Nottingham grading system. There are very few cases, very small series. In general, obviously, as a bad prognosis, it looks like a high-grade tumor. And importantly, though, if you have uh, a lesion that looks uh, circumscribed and entirely papillary and even may have a capsule, but the nuclear grade is high or the tumor is triple negative or HER2 positive, don't undercall it as an EPC because it would be staged as an cytocarcinoma. These are aggressive uh, tumors and should be treated as such. And this is what is recommended by the WHO. I always look for the presence of an associated in situ component in these cases. Sometimes uh, is absent, sometimes it can be very focal as demonstrated in this example. If there is no DCIS, do a workup to rule out a metastasis. 
uh, this particular case will get a three positive. SOX then can also be used. It is a new marker, but I have no experience with it. Uh, the RPS1, um, that also could be useful. And the differential would be, especially in elderly women with a metastasis from uh, an ovarian tumor. So Pax8 would be positive if uh, Mullerian origin. And this is my last slide summarizing all the various morphologic features. Remember, there are many different morphology of these papillary neoplasms. Use immunohistochemistry judiciously to help you classify these tumors. If you have papilloma without a TPA, uh, the upgrade rate in general is low. We don't excise them, but in European countries is regarded as a B3 lesion. So it's completely ex is excised by vacuum assisted biopsy. And then uh, the information in, that I presented about uh, EPC requiring low intermediate nuclear grade invasive papilla. If the nuclear grade is high, then uh, it's an EPC, it's an in invasive papillary carcinoma. Um, always consider metastatic carcinoma in that setting and the criteria for the to separate SPC in situ and uh, uh, SPC, solid papillary carcinoma with invasion. And I thank you very much. Uh, and uh, very good question.